Hi there, good morning. Uh, Vineyard Brussels, it's Alexander Fenter uh, speaking to you. I've been invited by Ricky Fenter and the leadership to, to share with you God's Word on this Easter Sunday morning. And what an honor, what a privilege to do this, um, to share with you. I, I wish I were there in person. I have such fond memories of uh, our visits to you for my wife Jill and I and the, the, the various conferences that we did there and having, having met many of you. So it, it really is an honor and a joy to, to share God's word. So God bless you as you hear what I have to say. And again, I just want to honor the presence of the King. King Jesus, you are here, even in cyberspace. You are in, in the lounge where people are listening, where in the hall at Vineyard Brussels, wherever people are listening. Jesus, you are there. We honor you, we bless you, and we worship you. Head of your church, your church bought with your precious, precious blood. Oh God, just pour out your Spirit upon us. Holy Spirit, come and teach us. Come and instruct us. Come and give me the words of life that you want to speak to this church at this time. Open our minds. Open my mouth. Let us have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. And above all, we thank you, King Jesus, that in your resurrection, in your death and in your resurrection, you are Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and the creator of new creation. And we receive you as such this morning. We honor and worship you as such this morning. In the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> so, folk, I'm going to be sharing with you from John's Gospel um, and give John's kind of narrative theology, his, uh, his account of the life, the death and the resurrection of, of Christ. And although it is Sunday morning, um, whereby we remember the resurrection, I just want to give you the background context to the build up to his death and then his resurrection. Uh, because it is important. So John's story begins wonderfully and powerfully. In the Genesis, John chapter 1 verse 1, in the Genesis was God, and the Word was with, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing was created without the Word. So John very clearly starts his gospel with the Genesis of creation where there is God and God speaking his word that creates all things but then God ends his gospel at least John ends his gospel <laughs> uh, with what is called an, an inclusio an opening and a closing what he says in the opening he says in the closing he ends of course with the resurrection stories of new creation so it goes from first creation in the beginning Genesis God speaking the word and creating all things. And then at the end, God speaking his new word, which is the risen word, which is the, the means of new creation in the midst of old creation. So that's the, that's the bracketing of his book. But then uh, John in verse 14 says that that word that God spoke to create all things actually became human took on human flesh and and the way that he describes it is that Jesus is is not only the living image of God as a human being full of grace and truth shining with glory but actually becomes God incarnate as the ultimate human being as the kind of human being that God intended all human beings to be in, in English we say he is the quintessential human being full of the glory of God, full of grace and truth. And of course, in contrast to the first Adam, who was made in the image of God, and then sinned against God, and the lights went out, and the glory went out of his body, this, this new Adam, 
Jesus of Nazareth <laughs> shines with the glory of God and the light never goes out. And that glory that shines through Jesus, full of grace and truth, reaches its climax in its full brightness on the cross where Jesus is truly glorified. That's John's theology. But then John does an interesting thing. And one of his devices in the way he writes his, story, his biography of Jesus is he continually refers to days. And that is very deliberate of John because of the build up to the end. So in verse 29 of chapter 1, he says, The next day John saw Jesus coming and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the Passover Lamb who will atone for the sins of Israel and take the judgment of God upon himself so that Israel can have a new exodus into the promised land, the kingdom of God. And so that's verse 20, 29, the next day. Verse 35, the next day John saw. Uh, verse 43, the next day Jesus decided. Chapter 2, verse 1, on the third day <laughs> there was a wedding at Cana in, um, in Galilee. And Jesus was, and, and his mother and the family were invited to the wedding. So John goes through the stranging of the first day, the second day, the third day, the next day. And it's interesting here on this particular story, of course, Jesus turns the water into wine, which in the context of John is basically prophetic symbol of the death and the resurrection of Christ. The water of Judaism is going to be turned into the wine of the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom in Jesus through his blood and then his resurrection, his transformation. And of course, the very next phrase after that story in John chapter 2 of the wedding, he says, after this, Jesus went um, back home and then they prepared for the Passover meal. And when he went to Jerusalem at that Passover, he said, this body, you see this temple, it's my body and it'll be destroyed. And in three days, I, um, I will build it again. He will rise again. So he's, he's basically saying, I'm going to die at Passover and I'm going to rise again. And uh, that is my blood, which is shed for you. That will bring about the new exodus of new creation. So then John goes on through his gospel this day, the next day and the next day. And then he comes eventually to chapter 12 when he starts the story of the crucifixion, the last week. And in chapter 12, verse 1, John says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived. And so John now starts backwards. Interesting, the countdown. Six days before the Passover, then five days, four days, three days, two days, one day. And he comes to the Friday. Um, so from chapter 12 all the way through to chapter 19, John tells what happens in that last week when Jesus is in Jerusalem before he's crucified on the Friday. And the Friday then is the, the sixth day of creation. And, and, and then the Saturday is the, is the Sabbath rest, the seventh day of creation. So then in chapter 19, what John does is when he describes then the buildup of that last week, which is like the week of first creation, it says in verse 19, verse 1, Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And that happens to be Friday morning, early in the morning, which is the sixth day of, um, of creation. And on that morning, Friday morning, the sixth day of creation, Pilate has Jesus flogged and they twist thorns and put it on his head and they push it down. And Jesus is obviously bleeding. And from the book of Isaiah... <laughs> Chapter 50, it says that they plowed up my back. And Jesus, as the suffering servant of God, as I prophesied 750 years before Jesus, about the coming of the servant of Yahweh who will suffer for the sins of the nation and make atonement. And Jesus took those servant songs to himself by, by memorizing them and meditating on them and formed his identity and his life calling and destiny 
around the suffering servant of Yahweh, believing with all his heart that he in fact was the one that was prophesied by Isaiah and he himself would be the suffering servant. And so Jesus carefully chose. He knew he would die. He believed God, his father, would vindicate him in resurrection. And he chose the Passover as the, the meal, the time and the place in Jerusalem where he would die. And he, and he, he enacted the, that prophetic enactment of judgment on the temple um, in that week, um, that last week in Jerusalem, uh, really knowing that that would provoke the powers, the Sanhedrin and the Romans, to actually plan to kill him. It would bring down the powers upon him, where he would absorb their violence in his body to save Israel from God's judgment, basically. And so Pilate then that morning, Friday morning, early in the morning when the crowd is there, he brings out Jesus before the crowd, who is totally bloody and, and messed up, and his back is plowed up like a field. And they clothe him with a purple robe, and he bring, they brought him out, um, um, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And then once more Pilate came out to the Jews and said, Look, I'm now bringing him out to you. And then he says a very interesting thing. So Jesus was standing there in front of them, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Here is the man. Behold the man. In the Old English it says, Behold, look, here's the man. And what John is doing by putting these words in Pilate's mouth or, or recording what Pilate said, is he's actually connoting or echoing very clearly Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. On the Friday, the sixth day of creation, it says, Then, after God worked for five days in creation, then God said, Let us create human beings. Let us create man in our image and in our likeness. And so Jesus is being presented as the ultimate man before um, creation and saying, behold, look at this man, the image of God. But when the people who were there looked at him, they saw a man so broken and so bleeding and so beaten up because of human violence and sin. And that is John's theology, that Jesus died for all human beings in our place, taking upon himself our brokenness, our sin, our hatred, our violence, and absorbing it into his body. And John's theology, which I didn't have, I don't have time to go into as the build-up, is basically that Jesus kept talking about his glory that he, and that he would be glorified when he dies, when he suffers and dies on the cross. And here the glory of God as the image of God in created Humanity, this, this man, sh begins to shine the brightest. But the paradox is that it's all through his extreme brokenness, which he takes into himself, into his own body. So that is verse 5. And then there is further discussions with the chief priests, and they shout, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate says, but I don't find any fault against him. And what charges do you bring against him? So the, the, the trial goes on. And then a little while later, down in verse 13, um, um, the, after again further accusations and explanations from the Sanhedrin and the high priest, then Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out again and sat down on the judge's seat at the place known that is the stone of the pavement, or Gabatha in, um, um, in uh, Aramaic. It was... It was the day of preparation, says John, in verse 14. The day of preparation of the Passover week, about the sixth hour. So it's the sixth day of the sixth hour. And John's emphasizing. John has this unique um, little device in the way he writes about days and times and hours to convey theological meaning and interpretation. 
And then on that sixth hour, Pilate says to the people, here is your king. So he first says, here is your man. Now he says, here is your king. And what John is doing in this is he's again deliberately in the Jewish mind and the Jewish reader of John's biography of Jesus is now echoing, here is the Jewish king. First, he's the, the ultimate human being dying in place of all human beings, all sons and daughters of Adam who have sinned. Now he's the Jewish king being presented to die for the nation Israel. And when he says, behold your king, it's a clear echo going back to this, this, the, 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 the song of the servant of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 13. And just listen to this. This is what John is echoing. And, and in fact, again, in the book of John, uh, in his story of the crucifixion of Jesus, it actually says that they saw his glory, Jesus' glory, as is spoken of in Isaiah. And he actually quotes Isaiah, meaning that it goes back to the suffering servant songs. So in Isaiah chapter 52 and chapter 53 is the last, the fourth song of the servant. And it starts off like this. Look, behold, see, <laughs> the same word. Look, here's your king says Pilate to the Jewish people, Look, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up, highly exalted as the king. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, because his appearance was so disfigured, beyond that of any human being, and his form was marred beyond human likeness, so will he sprinkle many nations and many kings will shut their mouths. Oh, King Alexander of Belgium will shut his mouth. I think it's King Alexander. Because of this king, Jesus, for what they were not told, they will now see. And what they have not heard, they will now understand. You know, the Jewish Mashiach, the anointed one, Mashiach is the word king, anointed one. They expected the Mashiach to be the son of David, the warrior king, who would basically destroy the Romans, drive out this oppressive, brutal, occupying army, and send Pilate back to Rome and liberate the land of Israel and establish the kingdom. But Jesus didn't come as a military, political conqueror to shed blood and establish the kingdom through the violent overthrow of God's enemies. Jesus chose that dark stream of prophetic um, prediction in the Hebrew prophets of the suffering servant as his identity, as his calling, as his dark vocation of suffering and his destiny to actually bring the kingdom. And instead of bringing the kingdom by violence, he would, he would paradoxically bring the kingdom by absorbing all the violence, not only of human beings, not only of the Roman Empire and of the Jewish authorities, but the violence of hell itself. All evil from the pit of hell can vent its hatred and violence on the Son of God, and Jesus will absorb it on Israel's behalf and on humanity's behalf, and thus make atonement so that we can be forgiven and that we can receive and enter the kingdom of peace, the kingdom of shalom. So what was not told about this, this king that is predicted to bring the kingdom God's king is now revealed because he's revealed as the suffering servant king who conquers by taking upon himself all of our sin and our brokenness. And so when Pilate says, look, here's the king, he's echoing Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 52, the king who actually takes upon himself all of Israel's pain and suffering. And then what happens is 
the description is of Jesus being crucified, and that happens on the sixth day of creation, the Friday. Then he is buried, and you have this beautiful story by John that just before the sun sets, because the Friday night then when the sun sets is the beginning of Shabbat, you, you, you all know that uh, in Hebrew understanding and in Israel today among Jews, the, the day begins at sunset. So when the sun sets, it's the end of, of today and it's, the, and it's the beginning of the new day. So that Friday night, they had to take Jesus' body down from the cross before the sun set because on the Friday night was the beginning of the Saturday, which was the Shabbat, and they could do no work. So you have in verse 38 of John chapter 19, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came and they two old men they asked Pilate for the body of Jesus and he gave permission and here's this tender beautiful story of them actually taking down Jesus this young 33 year old rabbi from Nazareth <laughs> whom they believed to be the Messiah but uh, they took his body down from the cross and they washed it and cleansed it and they anointed it with rich rich spices in 30 kilograms 30 kilograms of spices, which was only reserved for a king. Incredibly expensive. But Joseph Arimathea was a, a rich man and had a tomb nearby. And the, they anointed Jesus' body, wrapped it in clothes, and they put it in the tomb. And what, what John is saying, Jesus enters the Sabbath rest. Now God is resting on the seventh day of creation. He's worked for six days to of creation and on the and on the sixth day is the climax of God's creation where he creates human beings in his image and in his likeness that is the cross where God shines the brightness in all his glory through the broken body of Christ that actually redeems humanity back into the image of God and then chapter 20 verse 1 John begins early on the first day of the week he emphasizes again that first day of the week which is the sunday which is the eighth day of creation so creation ended on the sixth day on the seventh day god rested and on the eighth day adam and eve continued god's creation in the garden i'm talking about genesis chapter one and chapter two and so they were created to look after the garden, God's creation, and to continue his work of creation in the garden and to take the garden of Eden, which is in the Hebrew, Eden is delight, the garden of delight, paradise to the ends of the earth, to, re, to shalom the whole earth with God's creation. So the first day of the week, which is the Sunday, the the, the day of Adam and Eve continuing God's work of creation. On that first day of the week, while it is still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, that's John, the writer of this gospel, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. And of course, he's distraught. <laughs> so Peter and the other disciples started out and they ran to the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple, the younger one, John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. And he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the, the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. And the cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen from the body that had embalmed him, basically. And finally, the other disciple, Peter, who had reached the tomb, first went inside. Uh, sorry, that's John who reached the tomb. He went inside then after Peter. And he saw the, the linen cloth lying there and he believed. And they did not understand from the scriptures that Jesus would rise from the dead. It's remarkable what John says because Jesus taught them over a long period of time that he would rise again 
according to the scriptures, which is prophesied in Isaiah chapter 26 and prophesied, um, also hinted at in Isaiah 53 at the end. And it's definitely prophesied in Daniel chapter 12, which Jesus as a rabbi had memorized scripture, studied scripture and took them to himself, believing he was the fulfillment of the Hebrew prophets and that God would vindicate his choice to die for the nation through resurrection. And Jesus died only in faith, believing God would vindicate him in resurrection. He had no assurance that God would, but the disciples didn't grasp that. Then in verse 10, it says this, Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Now listen to how John describes the resurrection of story of Jesus. And as she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white. At the garden of Eden, there were two cherubim there at the entrance to the garden. And they were seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked the woman, why are you crying? <laughs> and uh, Mary, who so loved Jesus, that's, that's Mary Magdalene. She is distraught. Where have they taken the body of my Lord? And, and they say, she says, they have taken my Lord away, she said. And I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around um, and she saw Jesus standing there in the garden. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. Then he said, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? And thinking that he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, then please tell me where you have put him, and then I will go and find him. <laughs> what a remarkable thing. And then Jesus said to her, this gardener said to her, one word, he said, Mary. He called her by name. In Aramaic, it would have been Miriam. And then she turned toward him and suddenly realized, and she cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, <laughs> which means my teacher. It's a stronger word than rabbi, teacher. Rabbi, Rabboni is my teacher, my Lord. What John is basically saying here is that Jesus is the new Adam in a new garden of creation, making all things new because death has been defeated. The Messiah is risen again and he is alive in a new garden. So you guys in Brussels and in Europe, of course, are in the Northern Hemisphere. And now is springtime. It's the beginning of spring in the, um, in the Northern Hemisphere. So in Israel at the time, <laughs> when Jesus was put in that garden tomb, it's springtime in a garden full of blossoms and new flowers, which indicates summer is coming after the long winter of snow and darkness and rain. <laughs> it's springtime new creation. And so the way that John tells the story of Jesus's death and resurrection is clearly all about old creation and new creation. In the beginning, in the genesis of the first creation, there was the word who was with God and was God. And God spoke that word and created all things. And that word became a human being that shone with the glory of God as the very image and likeness of God, where Adam's light went out and lost the glory and everything became dark. Jesus, this human being, shone, this new Adam, shone with greater and greater glory until the sixth day of creation, where he took upon himself all of humanity's sin and brokenness, all of Israel's rebellion against God and idolatry, idol worship, and suffered and died in our place. 
And then on the eighth day of creation, this new Adam rose again in a new garden full of blossoms. It's new creation with a new Adam in the, in the garden. And here is Mary. And this phrase, woman, woman, the angels say, woman, why? What are you looking for? <laughs> Jesus, the gardener, the new Adam says, woman, why are you weeping? And of course, when God created Adam in Genesis chapter 2, in Genesis 1, we have the big story, the big picture. On the sixth day, God created humanity in his image and likeness, male and female created he them. In chapter 2, he zooms down the writer of Genesis into this specific order of creation. So first God created Adam out of the ground and breathed into Adam the breath of life. And God's spirit, it says, Ruach, breath, is God's spirit. And Adam became a living being. And then out of Adam, he created the woman and brought the woman to the man. And when Adam looked at the woman, he actually said the first time, you are called woman, Isha, because out of the man, Ish, was taken and God has created the Isha. And the word is woman, woman. For this reason, the man will leave his father and mother and will cleave to the woman, his wife, and they will become one flesh. And this word, woman, why are you weeping? Woman, whom are you looking for? And this presence of Mary in the garden with this gardener, <laughs> who is the new Adam in new creation. And so when she realizes it is Jesus, <laughs> she just cries with relief, my teacher, and falls at his feet and wants to cling to him, wants to hold on to him. And Jesus says, do not cling to me, hold on to me. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, for this reason, the man will leave his father and mother and will cleave, will cling to his wife, cling to the woman, and the two shall become one. And so the same connotation is here in John. All these are basically what John is saying. This whole story of, re of the resurrection of Jesus echoes the first garden and the story of first creation. But this is a new creation with a new Adam, new Eves. In a, that are authorized, have God's authority and are the renewed image of God to take new creation to the ends of the earth. Uh, so we have this mystical saying of Jesus here to Mary that John says, well, don't cling to me, don't hold on to me, because I've not yet returned to my father. But go and tell your brothers and your sisters that I'm returning to my my God, my Father, and your Father to my God and your God. And so evidently there was something there that in Jesus' resurrection and his appearance as the gardener, the new Adam in the garden, he, he ascended into heaven and cleansed the heavens with his blood. Because we know that for 40 days after his physical resurrection, he appeared and disappeared constantly to his disciples, teaching them about the kingdom and weaning them from dependence on his physical presence. Because they had been with Jesus for three and a half years physically, um, yeah, living with him, traveling with him, eating with him, and observing all the miracles. And they so, so loved him and so respected him. And, and, and they knew he was not only a rabbi, they knew he was a, a major prophet. And they dared to believe that he was the anointed one. He was Israel's king. But the way he was betrayed by Judas Iscariot after that supper, that last supper, the, the, the Passover meal, and the way he was taken by the Roman soldiers and the way he was tried by the high priest and then the Roman authorities and then flogged and beaten up to a pulp so that actually he was so swollen and bruised, he was beyond the recognition of a human being, just absorbing all of human sin, pain, brokenness, hatred, violence into his own body, the ultimate human being, shining with the full glory of God, which is the embodiment of God's love 
the ultimate statement of God's love, not only for humanity and for Israel, but for creation itself, is the cross of Christ. That when we look at the crucified Christ, we see the incarnation of the love of, of God for creation and for humanity. But then all of that changes on the eighth day of creation, that Sunday morning, which is the first day of new creation, as John emphasizes. It's the beginning <laughs> of new creation, <laughs> where there's, there is a whole new garden of delight, making all things new, full of flowers, full of blossoms, full of fragrances, just like the first garden of pristine, beautiful, clean, pure creation, the garden of delight. This is what John is saying. But Jesus ascends, cleanses the heavens with his blood, and then appears and disappears to his disciples. And that's why he said to her, don't cling to me, but go tell them I'm risen, I'm alive, and I will appear to them. So Mary immediately went to the disciples with this good news. <clears throat> I have seen the Lord. <laughs> and when Pilate said, Behold the man, behold the king for all humanity, for Israel. Look, now I've looked and I see that that crucified broken man is actually alive and risen. And he's the new Adam of new creation. And then, um, then John does a strange thing in verse 19, and I'm bringing this to a close. Ricky said I should speak for 40 minutes. I've got a few more minutes to talk. <laughs> But in verse 19, uh, John does a very interesting thing of John chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week. So the Jewish mind immediately knows that the evening is the next day. So it's no longer Sunday night. It's Monday because Monday begins on the Sunday night when the sun sets. But he doesn't say on the second day. He says on the evening of the first day, he, in other words, John is continuing to emphasize the first day of new creation, which is the eighth day of old creation with new Adam and Eve's continuing God's work of renewing the earth. So that is a strange way of writing it, but very deliberate by John to connote that this evening, the Sunday evening is still the first day of new creation. And listen to what he says. On that evening when the disciples were together, so it's the Sunday night of Jesus' morning resurrection, the doors were locked. They locked the doors for fear of the Jews. They were in a room and they were scared because the Jewish authorities were, be were already beginning to hunt down the followers of Jesus because they thought they had stolen his body and were passing a rumor around that he's resurrected and alive. But the, but the Jewish and the Roman authorities know that Jesus' followers had stolen his body and were starting this rumor. That's what they thought. So the Jews were locked, had, had the doors locked. John came, Jesus came in and stood among them. Jesus just materialized. He didn't come through the door or through the walls, or maybe came through the locked door. Maybe he came through the walls, but he just appeared in his physical resurrected body. You see, the resurrection body can appear and disappear, can go through walls. But it's a very real body because our human body from first creation has, it lives by flesh and blood. The life of the body, the life of the flesh is in the blood. It says in the book of Leviticus, when you shed the blood, the life goes out of the body. But Jesus here in this resurrection body, when he identifies himself, according to Luke, Luke says this very specifically, when they, he appears, they are so shocked, they think he's a ghost. <laughs> they, they think he's a spirit. <laughs> and he says, no, no, peace, peace, shalom, shalom aleichem, it's me. <laughs> it's Jesus. And then he says, touch me and see, I am flesh and bone, says Luke. Not flesh and blood. Jesus actually changes it. My body is of a different order of life. Because the principle of life in the, in the body of first creation that is corrupted by sin and death, is flesh and blood body. The principle of life is the blood. When the blood leaves the body, you die. The, the principle of life in the resurrected body of new creation is spirit. This body is so full of spirit that I can appear, disappear, walk through walls. I can eat 
or I can not eat for a thousand years, but this body lives by a different principle of spirit and no longer blood and all that it is subject to. So then Jesus says, it's me. Peace, shalom. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side and the disciples were overjoyed. So he identified himself by the scars, the wounds of the suffering servant, of suffering humanity, where he died on our behalf, of rebellious Israel, the king who took upon himself all of the wounding and the pain of Israel. And you know, dear friends, just think of this. Jesus identified himself by the marks of the cross. And then he ends up, it says, and then Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And with that, he breathed on them and received and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And that's the last point I want to make, is that here, John deliberately is quoting the Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament. In 150 BC, the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek, called the Septuagint. And it's the same phrase that is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, when God created Adam, it said he breathed into Adam the breath, his breath, and he became a living being. Ruach. Here is the new Adam breathing the spirit of the resurrection into new Adams and new Eves, 12 of them in the upper room or 11 of them in the upper room, new Adams and new Eves. And technically, that's when the church was born again with eternal life by the entrance of the spirit of Jesus, that is the spirit of the resurrection of new life, of eternal life, of new creation. And then he tells those new Adams and new Eves in the new garden of new creation, to go and forgive people their sins and take new creation to the ends of the earth, to basically re-shalom the earth with new creation in the midst of all creation. So, my dear good brothers and sisters at Brussels Vineyard, I bless you in the name of Jesus with new creation. Lord, let your blood be upon the hearts and the minds of everyone who listens to this recording and cleanse them from their sin as you have absorbed into your body Jesus on our behalf all of our brokenness all of our rebellion all of our hatred and violence that we may be forgiven and cleansed of our sin but more than that Jesus you rose again and I bless you with the resurrection spirit of Jesus to enter you to fill you and to transform you with a new name and a new identity and to live new creation. If anyone is in Messiah, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Everything becomes new. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.